Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and thanks to the committee for the opportunity to speak. Um, as you just heard, uh, Mark Parker uh, from African Eagle, younger, better looking than I, is going to run you through the second half of the presentation, which is about his opinions uh, of being a listed junior minor on AIM. I'm just going to try and put a little bit of uh, flesh on the bone just to uh, give you some background on AIM, where it sits and what it does for, for mining companies. Uh, hopefully remind you all of happier days, perhaps. Um, so let's crash on. Uh, disclaimer, most important slide here, particularly bearing in mind what Mark's going to say. Um, just to put London, not just AIM, but to, uh, just to put London in context quickly, uh, we're using uh, transactions, a number of transactions done in 2007 as a, as a measure here, but putting it uh, in context against some of the other mining-friendly markets, you can see that there's been a plethora of activity over in Canada, lots, of, uh, lots and lots of deals, relatively low-value deals. A similar trend in Australia, uh, not to such a great extent, but a similar trend, lots and lots of deals, relatively low-value uh, on average. London perhaps has been a happy medium, for want of a better word. Um, Decent-sized transactions and a good number of them. And then, of course, last year, uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai, relatively immature markets, uh, just a couple of mining deals there, but tons of demand, lots of money coming in over there. So that's where London sits, sort of second or third, in, in terms of mining. Um, just to move on to AIM, uh, I'm sure many of you know all this, but, of course, uh, launched by the London Stock Exchange in, in 1995 as a as a market for, for junior uh, developing companies uh, based upon uh, more flexible regulation. Uh, and it's been, I think when you look from 95 to 2008, up to all the stats I'll show you up to the end of August, when you look, it's, it's been relatively successful. Uh, currently sitting at just over 1,600 companies, market cap of 79 billion pounds, not insignificant, uh, but still very much a junior market um, with uh, over 70% of those companies with, with a market cap of less than uh, 50 million quid, um, so a junior market per se. What's it been doing and how's it been performing? Well, pretty bloody badly, obviously. Uh, this, is, uh, to, this, is, this chart obviously moves all the time, but this was drawn up on Friday uh, of last week. If, we, if you drew this chart at the end of June, actually AIM would have been the best performer, for want of a better phrase, down about 8.5%. Uh, but it's really been in the last uh, couple of months it's taken a, a terrible kicking, which Probably you would expect it in, in these markets. It, it's, the, it's the most junior market. It has uh, big exposure to the natural resource area and financial sector. There's something like 28% of the market made up of what, uh, what AIM calls financials. Uh, so it's, it's taken uh, a very severe battering in the last couple of months. But it had been performing reasonably well. How's it grown? Uh, so we're just two, two charts coming up. One here looking at uh, numbers of companies coming to the market. Obviously, yeah. Fantastic growth, and as I said at the moment, over 1,600 companies on the market. A couple of things to point out. Obviously, the peak in 2000 with the technology boom, and then this uptick in, from 2003 through to 2005. Lots of new uh, companies coming to the market. Uh, obviously, you've got the commodities boom, realisation coming in there, and, and lots of credit available. Lots of people with lots of money to, to invest, uh, and, and the company, total number of companies growing quite well. Uh, so far, in 2008, actually, you'll just notice at the top of that chart... Um, that it's actually just reduced a little bit from 2007 and, and perhaps for the first time we'll actually see the market contract just a little bit this year, as I say this is to the end of August, just contract a little bit. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that losing companies off a, off a market like AIM is, is a very natural thing. Hopefully it means that companies are moving up to the main list uh, or they're being taken over or merged in lovely value accreting deals. Uh, but obviously in there as well are some companies that go to the wall and some companies which choose to come off the market. Um, being a listed company hasn't allowed them to fulfill their business objectives and they come off the market. And so far, 2008 is the first year where we've seen that balance swing to, uh, uh, to a slight reduction. Mm -hmm. Still time to play with, of course. Uh, and looking at the other key parameter, funds raised, you can see this enormous growth that we had uh, in the last sort of three, four, five years. Um, I think the key thing here for me is that switch you're seeing. When you look uh, in, in from 2001 or 2003 onwards, it's really new companies coming to the market who are doing the significant fundraising. That's where a lot of the money is coming into the market, not so much in the way of secondary business. But then in 2007, we've got that, that key switch, I think, uh, from fewer or, or less money being raised in terms of IPO, but a lot of secondary business. And I think that shows that the market perhaps is maturing. 
I hope it doesn't mean that the market is closing to new companies, and I don't think it is. I mean, you can still see that business has been done in 2008. The last couple of months, of course, have been incredibly difficult, but business was being done uh, this year. Um, and it, again, it shows that, that trend in 2008, more secondary business than, than primary business. <coughs> Those are the aims sectors I was talking about before, that heavy exposure to what they call basic resources, mining, uh, oil and gas and financials. Uh, so pretty heavy exposure there and in a junior way, which has really uh, uh, caused the market to fall quite as much as it has, I believe. Uh, just to reiterate, Mark just asked me to include this slide, and I thought uh, it's a very good point from the last speaker, but uh, plus markets yet yeah, not to be underestimated at all um, uh, in, in regard to AIM. It's been a great uh, incubator of, of mining exploration stocks. And uh, as talked about previously, uh, there has been a lot of liquidity there. There's decent levels of trading, sometimes more than we, uh, than we see on AIM for some of these junior companies. So you know, not trying to rubbish plus markets in the slightest. Um, back to AIM very quickly. Uh, we're looking at the miners now. Uh, just really s seeing the general market trend. It is a junior market where we were seeing overall just over 70% of companies with a market cap of less than 50 million. In the mining sector, it's actually 80 uh, below 50 million, just a few here at the top end. What are they doing? Where are they doing it? Well, the uh, focus is on Africa. It's obviously been a, a traditional gateway into Africa from London, but obviously the same applies, I think, to projects in Europe, the FSU. But don't, don't forget what's going on in, in both North and South America. It's not just all coming out of Toronto. Stuff uh, has been going on in London, I suppose, particularly with a, with a bent on South America, uh, but not to be underestimated. And the same with Australia and, and the argument with the ASX there as well. Uh, what are they looking for? They're looking for gold primarily and precious metals. There's a decent block of platinum miners, obviously. Uh, then base metals, and that's dominated by mm -hmm. copper, and then nickel and zinc. Uh, a healthy slug of diamond producers and other gemstones. And in, in amongst energy minerals, we have you know, some uranium players, but also some growing coal players as well, uh, which is obviously a very exciting sector at the moment. And looking about what business has been done in AIM in the mining sector, um, overall, we saw at the moment it's about 15% of, of the market is made up of mining companies. Since 2001, we've had over 200 <coughs> listing, and it, that represents about 10% of all companies listed. A, a relatively meagre amount of money raised at those IPOs, just 4% of the, the total funds raised at IPOs, over, just over a billion pounds. And I think that shows that you know, there's a number of junior companies coming to the market who wanted limited funds and hopefully have grown while they're on the market. And I think that's true for true for some. Obviously 2005 was the, was the key year of growth uh, and it's reflecting that trend we were talking about overall of, of the number of IPOs coming down. I think in 2008 so far it's been five in our sector. I think the last one was, was in July. Um, in those IPOs I think about 70 million quid raised. So a decent, a decent amount of business being done. Out, out of about a billion it's about six or seven percent I think uh, off the top of my head uh, this year. So some business being done, but as I said, the last couple of months have been uh, extremely difficult. Looking at that, um, the other side, and I think this is it, so much of the, the funding for mining has come once people are listed, coming through in terms of secondary fundraisings, uh, just under 5 billion raised out of a total of, I think, about 24.5 billion in secondary fundraisings on AIM since 2001, so that's about 19, 20% of the total coming into the sector. Uh, and I hope, you yeah, know, that's companies growing while they're on the market. In this year, again, just trying to make the point that business was being done until uh, the really last wave of uh, turbulence uh, has struck. £700 million uh, pounds worth of, of deals done, which is about 25% of all secondary business. That's the best percentage of total business uh, that the mining sector has achieved, um, certainly in this period. I think it was as low as 15% back in 2006. So although, yes, the mining sector on AIM has fared relatively poorly and some of you may feel, you know, those on the boards of company may feel deserted. I think actually as a sector it's, it's fared a little better than others and there has been money coming in. Of course the crucial question is what, what is going to happen next and frankly your guess is as good as mine. And I'm just going to finish, before I hand over to Mark, uh, I just wanted to finish with this slide which I've, which I've stolen from um, Altus Resources, um, which I thank them for, they didn't know I was going to steal it. Uh, just to talk you through this, um, the top, the lovely dark blue line which is roaring away at the top is the FTSE, all, all mining index, so all, all the big players in there, 
you know, performing fantastically. That middle uh, blue line is uh, what they're calling small cap, which is around up to 90 million pound market cap companies. And the blue line, which is trundling along the bottom, looking a bit sorry for itself, is, is what they're calling the fledgling index, companies below 20 odd million pounds market cap. And I think there's two ways of looking at that chart. I, th I think perhaps if you're a, a fund manager really feeling the squeeze and hiding under your desk wearing your tin hat at the moment, you're, saying, you're perhaps saying, well, I told you so. I, you know, I was right not to put all my money in junior mining. It's, it's underperformed. I'm glad I, I invested in, 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 the, uh, in the larger stocks. But I think it's, it's up, to, up to me and up to everyone else to keep reiterating the points that uh, you know, there is, uh, in the long term, fantastic demand for these commodities. There is fantastic value hidden in a lot of these companies. There's, there's fantastic assets. And with investment and support, there's no reason why we cannot have a re-rating of those more junior sectors up towards that kind of uh, level of performance we've seen at the top. So uh, we hope that uh, people can keep their faith. The question is, does AIM allow that growth to come? Are, are there issues on the AIM market and in the regulations and, and the legislation that are going to allow that growth to come through? And I think that's some of the issues that, uh, that Mark is going to tackle now. So I'll hand over to him. Uh, thanks, Asa. I now have to do the pit bull to your greyhound. Uh, the, next, the last time I, I gave a talk on, on this subject, which was, was for the AMA, actually, uh, the organisers asked me to give a warts and all account of the process, the actual process of getting a name listing. Um, it was a process that was quite stressful for African Eagle because we had multiple mineral licences in three African countries. We had seven lots of accountants in five countries producing books five sets of lawyers in four countries doing due diligence, and then there was a hiccup brought on by one of our countries of operation being in the process of going through a new investment code. To avoid the risk of that talk just appearing to be a list of whinges, uh, we decided that I should play it for laughs. Um, it wasn't so hard to do at the time, uh, as the metal spoon was just getting underway. But now, in the middle of the uh, biggest financial storm for decades, uh, and with four years' experience of being AIM listed, it's a bit more difficult to be jocular. So you can prepare yourself for a list of whinges. <laughs> um, as I said, the process of preparing a document for AIM admission for a junior mining company is not a trivial one. Uh, it takes up quite a lot of resources, management time and uh, cash. Um, to some extent, of course, the amount of work depends on how much your nomad and legal advisor suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, some evidently don't. I have read a few prospectuses which uh, have left me completely gobsmacked at their free and easy way with the facts. And looking outside London, even reports prepared under the so-called gold standard of disclosure, Canadian National Instrument 43101, uh, some of those reports can really leave you gasping. For any reasonably conscientious com company with reasonable uh, advisors, however, writing a prospectus is a main, major devourer of management time, effort and cash, especially for a small company with limited management uh, resources. And I want to return to that issue in the context of secondary financings. Let's look at some statistics that should... Oh. What did I do? Oh, it's the wrong one. What's happened, guys? Come on. Push the bottom one, push it again. Got it? Okay. <laughs> no, that's the wrong one. I want. Yeah? Okay, never mind. You, you don't really need it. Uh, the slide I was going to show you was a histogram of liquidities of all the AIM-listed resources companies during July 2008. As a measure of liquidity for each company, I used simply the number of shares traded during that month as a percentage of that company's total issued shares. The graph would have shown the proportions of AIM's, AIM resources companies which traded in the liquidity bands shown. Uh, the key statistics, the maximum liquidity for any one company by that measure was 27% of its total issued capital. The median, however, was less than 
and more than a third of all the AIM companies surveyed uh, more than a third of all the AIM companies surveyed here traded less than 1% of their there we are no? oh yeah oh yeah still there right that's it good okay Median 1.9, more than 10% traded less than 1% of their total issued share capital during the month. Only one-tenth of the companies traded more than 10% of their issued uh, equity. Now, is, that, is it just a recent phenomenon brought on by, uh, by the simple economic fact at the moment of there being more sellers than buyers? In other words, is it just a logjam? Probably to some extent it is, as a liquid share will trade when shareholders need to raise funds, simply because they can trade. Illiquid shares eventually suffer worse in, in markets like this, as there comes a time when the marginal seller will accept any price. Uh, generally, though, the more shareholders, the better. It's, it's something that, that we uh, enjoy in African Eagle, that sets us apart perhaps from some of our peer group. Uh, and that's partly because we did a couple of years' apprenticeship on OFEX, which brought us a lot of retail investors. Uh, we, we have about 5% liquidity by this uh, measure, which puts us in the top quartile of AIM firms, and that's about the same uh, in July this year as it was for the whole average of uh, 2006. So I don't see a particularly great trend of, of decreasing liquidity. Uh, in that. I believe that the generally poor liquidity on AIM companies, and that's something that's been referred to by other speakers, is one of the great weaknesses of the London markets in general, AIM in particular, that the market is dominated by institutional funds and doesn't really enjoy a, a vibrant retail element. In fact, I'd go much further than that and I'd say that the London markets and AIM discriminates outrageously against retail investors. In doing so, it also has the effect of discriminating against smaller companies. Not only does AIM discourage retail investors uh, and traders, it actually allows IPOs to proceed with a very small number of institutional and, and insider investors only. You compare this with Australia, where a listing can't proceed, an IPO can't go ahead unless you have a minimum of 400 shareholders. Canada, I believe, has a similar kind of threshold. In a liquid market sustained by a large number of shareholders, uh, having a large number of shareholders can be a disadvantage in the current market because larger funds which may have to sell to meet redemption requirements can sell into liquid companies. And that's why in AIM at the moment, the more liquid companies are probably the least good performers. Uh, but this, of course, is an opportunity for smaller investors, but not helpful to the companies. Now, brings us to another point, which is uh, another major drag on liquidity is the relatively high cost of transactions. To make a profit trading against stamp duty, broker's fees, and market spread is a pretty tall order for any investor, and especially for a retail investor trading probably online or through his bank uh, who doesn't have the clout to negotiate. Um, stamp duty, of course, is a straightforward tax on liquidity. If you buy £10,000 worth of shares, and you, then you just pay £50 tax. It doesn't sound too bad. But if you try and make that £10,000 work for you by trading once a week over a year, you'll end up paying £2,500 of stamp duty. That's a quarter of your entire capital. It's not even a level playing field. Stamp duty is not payable on all securities, uh, ETCs, for example. Competition probably keeps broker's fees down to a minimum, so there's probably not a lot of, uh, of room for improvement there. But spreads, I believe, are a real hurdle and hurt, most of all, smallest companies when their share prices are, are at a minimum. Now, I set up a, a rather simplistic Mickey Mouse trading model assuming a portfolio operated by a fairly active trader. This is uh, £100,000, which uh, he's investing equally across 20 stocks. And he trades in and out of all 20 positions 10 times over. 
The simplifying assumption that I had to make is that all of his shares are similarly priced. This slide shows that the smallest average gain he has to make just to overcome his transaction costs. And if he's trading 2p shares, he needs to make a 30% gain on each transaction before he even breaks even on his trading. Clearly there's a severe penalty in trading penny shares. And uh, Asa, I'm going to be talking to Seymour Pierce in the near future about a, doing a 1 for 20 consolidation of our stock. Um, until last year, retail investors who chose smaller companies had at least the capital gains tax taper relief to compensate them, but now that's gone, and there's very little to recommend the junior markets to retail. Yet another factor discriminating against the retail investor is the way that the odds are stacked against existing shareholders participating in secondary financings. They're locked out. Share subscriptions in a company uh, doing a placing are generally free of stamp duty and they're usually discounted, almost always. But retail shareholders are cut off entirely from the benefit of this because the majority uh, uh, of existing shareholders can't be invited to participate unless the company issues a full prospectus. I've already mentioned the, the burden of time and so on on producing a prospectus. Consequently, companies raising finance just follow their brokers along the well-worn path to the institutional investors. And even there, there lie other snags for the smaller company. If you imagine a, a fund with, say, 200 million under management, it'll probably have a sensible investment guideline that it can't own more than 10% of any company. Uh, so that um, uh, means that it can't really look at a company with a market cap of less than 10 million. It'll probably have another investment guideline that it, uh, it won't put less than, say, one half of 1% of its fund um, into any investment. Uh, obviously, it can't have a huge number of small uh, investments because of the overheads. Um, so therefore, there's, there's a gap, the institutional investment gap, between uh, these two crucial figures. Um, London, the London system forces companies to go to institutions, but the institutions can't always deliver because of these kinds of rules. So the, the ticks are adding up on the dark side. Returning to retail traders now, uh, existing shareholders are likely well, wouldn't you think existing shareholders are likely to do their research on the company in which they're invested, prospectus or no prospectus. And surely the, the regulators then could come up with some way to avoid excluding them when the company wishes to raise money. In Australia, they do things a little better. Companies can offer existing shareholders the opportunity to acquire up to 5,000 uh, Australian dollars worth of additional shares under a share purchase plan without the requirement to produce a, a prospectus. The ASX's declared aim there was to provide long-term shareholders the opportunity to purchase shares at a discount to the market price as a reward for their loyalty. And I believe uh, since July last year, it's also been possible for Australia-listed companies to make a pro rata rights issue uh, to existing security holders without a disclosure document, providing that the issuer releases a, a notice to the market more than 24 hours before the offer is made, and there are various other conditions. But it can be done. Retail investors are also discriminated against because they can't easily access brokers' research. Uh, companies pay their brokers, we pay ASA, to produce research, but we, we, can't, put, <laughs> we can't put it on our website because uh, you have to be a sophisticated investor, whatever that means, to read it. Um, yes, I know, th those rules are, are, are broken and bent, but uh, a strict interpretation of the rules definitely stops companies from circulating these notes, uh, and the alternative is commissioned research, which uh, isn't always the same quality. Um, and if retail investors are discriminated against, then how much more so are company directors? I won't even start to discuss the rules on closed periods. Uh, particularly as they affect uh, junior miners, and uh, in particular nomads' inter uh, enthusiastic interpretations of those rules. 
So if there are any regulators out there, uh, please just take note. Okay, right. I promised you a whinge, and I've I delivered. Um, to wind up the presentation, Asa and I uh, tried looking in our crystal balls to um, discern trends uh, for the future of junior resources markets. This is only for entertainment at the moment, as uh, several speakers have said already. For heaven's sake. Several speakers have said already um, you can't uh, predict the future. And I'm sure you all read that disclaimer carefully. For the last year or so, juniors have found it increasingly difficult to raise finance for exploration and for development. Nonetheless, few commentators expect metals prices to fall back to 1990s levels not only because operating costs are, are likely to remain high, but because supply is unlikely to exceed demand for several more years. There are still a billion housewives in China and India who want that washing machine, that fridge, and that air conditioner. And those nations will still have to build the infrastructure to support those demands. History shows us that metal consumption per capita is much higher during this development phase of an economy than it is when nations are already rich. Copper demand since 1950, for example, indicate that in the next 23 years we'll have to dig up as much copper as has ever been produced in the entire history of the world. Where are these new discoveries coming from that, that are going to meet the demand? There is not enough in the pipeline on account of the decade and more during which exploration was largely ignored and underfunded. The sector is therefore likely, I believe, to offer opportunities, and it seems uh, it seems very likely that mid-sized and large miners, cash rich from these high metals prices, will snap up promising juniors. We also foresee an increased role for private equity, uh, backing favoured juniors, perhaps taking them uh, off the list uh, or using them as vehicles for further consolidation uh, of distressed companies with good assets. For those juniors like African Eagle, and a quick plug here, which have excellent assets and reasonable cash in the bank, it's our duty to our shareholders in these times to conserve the cash and survive the downturn in order to emerge stronger into the bright post-crunch dawn of continuing high metals prices. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff Mason, St. Barbara. Mark, that was interesting on the liquidity issue, but could you compare other markets just so that we sort of get some feel for what that liquidity or illiquidity means? Uh, I didn't have time to do that. I'll put my hand up. I, I wanted to, to look at, uh, at Australia and Canada um, to see what liquidities of those companies were like, but uh, I'm afraid I just didn't have time to do it. Does anybody know here in the audience? No. Uh, thanks, Mark. This is actually a question. It's a Steve Holden, a question for uh, Asa. Uh, it's regarding consolidation. And specifically, I was wondering whether... Seymour Pierce or yourself had a view on consolidation um, of the brokers? <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's happening, isn't it? I think uh, the bread and butter model, uh, which Seymour Pierce and so many of our competitors have focused on AIM, have followed so happily for so many years, is, is starting to, to ring true. And it's been particularly hard for those brokers who have public listings, whether it's on AIM or elsewhere, uh, because uh, that work has dried up and their numbers don't look as pretty as they, as they once did. And we've seen a number of players come in and take, and take stakes in those companies. Uh, there's been investments from, from India, the Middle East, I think, uh, the Far East. Uh, I'm Iceland. very happy to be proved wrong. Iceland, yeah. Um, so 
It is happening, um, and I think it will continue to happen if if markets stay stay in a in a pretty poorly state.